Good morning. Welcome to my studio here in beautiful Carmel. I hope you are well and we'll be reading chapters 10 and 11 in the teachings of Yama, a conversation with death. Chapter 10 deals with the three qualities of the mind. And chapter 11 is satisfying desires, sex, guilt, self-control, the naked body symbolism. I hope you enjoy. If you do, if you do, please hit that like button and subscribe. I have lots of things to, for you to view. Chapter 10. Dear Yama, I said, after pondering the last lesson, you have shown that the mind cannot be relied upon to lead one to truth. And you have stated clearly that no activity can bring one to that which is beyond. On the other hand, you teach that virtues need to be cultivated to prepare one for self-realization. This seems paradoxical. Please clarify. While the mind cannot lead one to that, to God, it can reflect that, if free from desires, safe from the storms of passions. Come. Yama transformed us into two crows perched upon a branch of a tall tree in a forest. Below us on a path walked a man. Suddenly three robbers jumped out from behind the trees, one dressed in black, one in red, and the other in white. The one in black grabbed the scared traveler, brandishing a wicked sword. You have come into our realm, for that you must die. And so the robber led the man into a dilapidated hut. We flew to the windowsill. Inside was dark and we could barely make out the man stretched on the floor with all his limbs tied. Upon the traveler's chest, the robber in black placed a large weight. Laughing at the poor man's plight, he left the hut. Day after day he came, adding more weight each time, until it looked as though one more time would crush the breath forever out of the man. <clears throat> then one day, while the one in black was absent, the robber in red, carrying a whip, came in and removed the weights and cut the cords. As the man regained his breath, the robber snapped his large whip and said, You are now my slave. Again, he cracked his whip and told the man to move along. Every day the robber had this man at work, cracking his whip. Like an ox, he plowed fields. Like a horse, he carried the robber on his shoulders. He spent some days gathering fruit from the orchards, and on others he spent counting out the thief's treasure. At first, all this work was a joy in contrast to the crushing weights of the first robber. However, soon days began to merge in each other, and his back strained under his labors, and silently the man prayed for freedom at each crack of the whip. Finally, when he was lying exhausted in a moment of reprieve, his master off tending to some other affair, the robber in white came and said to him, Traveler, do you seek freedom? Then come with me. Calmly, the third robber led the man throughout the forest. He said little, if anything at all, though he smilingly pointed at some of the marvels on the way. Occasionally, the robber would burst out in songs about God or recite sacred poems. Often, he just smiled and held the traveler's hand. In the presence of this robber, the traveler soon lost his fatigue. Finally, they came to a road. This is the road to the kingdom from which you came, said the robber in white. Come with me, friend, said the traveler. You will be well rewarded for your service in freeing me. The robber smiled. I cannot, for I am a thief. I was born one and will always be so. Yama and I, still as crows, watched the man go forth upon the road while his liberator returned back into the forest. When we transformed back into the shapes of men, we stopped alone on the road. Okay, no doubt there is hidden meaning in this past scene, I said. 
Who was the traveler and who were the robbers? The traveler is the self or the individual. The eye sense of consciousness that identifies with the body, whether physical or metaphysical. The thieves are the qualities found everywhere in the universe, for they are the qualities of the mind. The first, the black, is called Thomas, or ignorance. He is a dullard, a sloth, paralyzed by fear. He is the eater of unclean flesh and food decaying. To be in his power is to sink into the squalor of despair, and death is the only release, or so Thomas says. However, the second thief, named Rajas, or passion, the red one, can free one from the darkness by his passions, his fire, just as fire can free water trapped in ice. Out of the dullness of inactivity he whips the individual into action, like a storm blowing a stagnant lake into a lake of waves and dispersing the slime. Deeds are done, goals are accomplished, the feeling of I am getting something done warms the soul. Yet Rajas does not stop with his whip. With every desire fulfilled, a hundred more seeds are strewn in the field of the mind. Hopes of gain and fear of losing occupies the thoughts of Rajas. What was freedom for the soul or individual becomes enslavement, and the soul cries for release. Thus hearing the soul's cry for release, Sattva, the pure, the white one, comes and frees the soul from the whip of Rajas by gently leading him into the beauty of nature, the appreciation of the sacred, and to hear the silence within oneself, just as the sun calmly and steadily shines its rays upon the lake, freeing the water from the earth to rise into the sky. The road Sattva leads upon, one upon is the road of virtues. The individual becomes calm as he knows he nears his origin. However, being that sattva is of the mind, of nature, of all that is manifest, it is still a robber. He cannot go to the origin of the soul, to that which is beyond the mind. Thus concluded Yama, while the mind can point to liberation, it is powerless to take one there. Why are they called robbers, these qualities of the mind, I asked. These three are thieves because being of the mind, the soul's awareness of the original state of oneness is stolen, and the soul identifies itself with the manifested, forgetting the unity, and believes itself separate. Only when the mind of one is taught that no happiness lies in the world of changing forms, and that by only finding the eternal being can happiness be found, then the mind points the soul the individual back home. Chapter 11 Thank you, Yama, I said. You have shown clearly that by fostering virtues the mind leads one to liberation, yet in themselves are not the soul, the goal. Tell me, please, is it virtuous to abstain from sex? Some say it is the natural as eating, and like eating should be done in moderation. Only the ignorant would say such a thing, those who continue to seek to taste the sweet fruits of the world while hoping to avoid the bitter. Yet I as death exist in both. One eats to feed the body, that the soul may find freedom in one's life as a human being. And one ought to eat in moderation. One need to copulate to create bodies for other souls, needing a human body to find freedom. Yes, one can express love, which certainly leads one into the expansion of unity through having sex, just as one can express love by the cooking and sharing of a meal. Yet if one is really wanting to share love, and not in truth just seeking pleasure, love is not restricted to having sex. Behold that child. In front of us ran a naked little boy chasing a hoop. The hoop rolled into some bushes. Heedless, he ran into them to retrieve the hoop. Isn't that poison oak? I asked Yoma. It certainly is. He took the hoop out and off he went, chasing it some more. 
He is totally unaware of his body, his nakedness, he said. However soon, poisoned by the bush, he will think of nothing else but to satisfy his body's need to be scratched. And once he starts scratching, he will not be able to stop until scratching becomes painful and his body oozes with sores. And so it is with sex. If youth is not protected from the lures of the pleasures of sex, which is so pervasive in your society, not guided to the goal beyond the body and the mind, the hoop, then once he starts he will itch and itch, and will become little more than a rutting beast, seeing the other human beings as nothing more than bodies needing to satisfy his itch. I understand what you say, dear Yama. Yet what happens to one who is not who is not protected and has scratched over many years? I asked a little sheepishly, trying hard not to scratch the itches that were popping up over my body. Can the itching stop? Yes, it can stop, yet not without effort. However, just like any virtue, it is not the goal, but can help one achieve the goal. The mind must be drawn away from the world and focus on the divine, whether with form, like a god or goddess, or without form as in the light of consciousness. One can control one's breath, associate with the holy, read scriptures, and engage the body in healthy physical activities. And of course, he said laughing, take plenty of cold showers. Should one feel guilty when one scratches that powerful itch? Yama laughed even louder. Guilt will always keep you bound to this world. For guilt tells you that you are not divine, that you are a little speck in the cosmos called your body, that you must get someplace called perfection in order to be divine. No, guilt does not help, but awareness and truthfulness does. When you scratch, do not pretend you are not, or make up some excuse why you must. Scratch and give it to God, and then like with all activity, let God take care of it. See those two monks over there by the river? asked Yama. Yes, one of them is helping a lady, a young lady cross it by carrying her. He certainly is. Look at the other monk. He looks quite angry, I said. Yama said nothing. I watched the one carrying the lady across the deep waters and then set her down. With a calm face, he headed our way. The other monk fumed, his face twisted in contortions. When they reached us, the monk who had carried the woman bowed to Yama, while the others seemed not to have even noticed us. Without being able to contain it any longer, the latter blurted out, You touched a woman! You are a monk! Not only did you touch her, but you carried her! And you were happy the whole while! The calm monk looked at us and then asked me, who has carried the woman longer, he or I? The other monk looked puzzled. For a moment I do not know what to say, for obviously only this monk had carried the woman. Then when I saw Yama with his big grin, I realized the monk's point, and all three of us broke out in laughter. The serious monk turned red at being the butt of a joke he did not understand. I said to him, Dear monk, your brother let go of the woman at the river, but you have carried her in your mind from the moment he touched her. The calm monk bowed to us, and off they went. The other silent and sullen stood there, still carrying the woman. That is dwelling upon the act, said Yama as he continued his lesson. Resist what you can for as long as you can, However, do not overly strain. The more self-control, the more grace can help you. And the more grace, the more self-control. When you become free from itching, I, as death, will not chase after you. In each body there are stored vital forces that keep the mind strong and the body healthy. The man can lose his vital forces with each ejaculation, dispersing them into the world. Instead, this force can be directed like a laser to the divine. The sexual urge is more difficult, more obvious for a man. Many a great man has fallen to the baseness of sex. 
Women do not lose their vital forces like men losing their semen, yet they can become attached to the pleasure. Also, as they take in man's life force, they take in some of his qualities as well. Now, only, now not only does the woman have to overcome her own lower tendencies, but has acquired new ones as well. Please tell me more about sex, Yoma, since it entices so many in the world. The human body can be viewed as a beautiful book of knowledge, or a divine form of creation, instead of a means to gratify the desire for pleasures. The man's sexual organ located in the area of the will is external, reminding him that he is to act in the world with one pointed attention. His organ points upward when aroused, reminding him his greatest arousal lies in the acting for higher purposes. The woman, on the other hand, has her sexual organs inside. Her actions are greatest on the whole, inwardly, passively taking in the active forces of creation to gestate into wisdom. Her outwardness comes in expressing her love as her breasts extend outward from her heart area. She is a natural nurturer and she derives true pleasure from nurturing. For in nurturing, giving, she will find the expression of love and reminds others of their divinity. The man, however, finds not finds love not outwardly so much, but inwardly. His real breasts are on the inside suckling his own divinity, which then grows into action in the world. This is why men generally seek solitude to find themselves, while women generally need to be with others. Tell me, dear Yama, I said, there are many in my land who speak of the path of Tantra, which may involve sexual rituals among other things. Can one be liberated, find the self through such actions? Yama smiled. Remember, no action can bring one home. What you speak of is one aspect of Tantra, called the left-handed path, which espouses transforming desires and directing them towards the divine. Unlike the cultivation of virtues of the right-handed path, virtues are not emphasized or sometimes eschewed outright with the left-handed one. Powers are sought by harnessing the fire of sexual energies in the mind. It is wrought with dangers. The practitioner must keep her focus on the divine, otherwise powers will entrap her. In your time, in your culture of the West, many are taking pieces of various puzzles, pathways, and trying to make them fit. <clears throat> many are walking one moment on the right path, then their minds or some book tell them to spiritualize their desires and fulfill them, thereby sending them to the left path. And so they become jugglers, constantly picking up the balls they drop, going nowhere. Either follow one side or the other, but mind you, the right side is safer. Of course, better yet, is the no path, or the pathless path. But few want that one. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.